Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Today we're talking to Catherine Mangu Ward, who is the editor in chief at Reason Magazine, and we're going to deal with free speech and its enemies and ask the most fundamental question Is Mark Zuckerberg an alien from a planet of lizards? Check it out. So you guys are launching a new website. When, when does the new website come out? Uh, if all goes well, it will be live before the end of the month. And uh, yeah, 50 years worth of Reason Archives, not to mention every passing blog posty thought from the entire late 90s and early aughts. There's a lot to there's a lot to move over. Has, has Lanny Friedlander's stuff, like the first stuff, has it always been on there? Yes, it's it's on there. Uh, it holds up surprisingly well, especially his manifesto from the very first issue, which has this great, you know, logic, not legends, you know, coherence, not contradictions. It's yeah. it's uh, it feels very on point. We printed it on T-shirts this year. Just I to have one of those remind t-shirts. ourselves where we come from. I was going to so. wear it, but I thought that would be a little too. But then you thought boy. Lebowski yeah. 2020 instead was yeah, the makes, way to go. It makes more sense. Yeah. Um, Catherine Mangu Ward, the editor in chief of Reason Magazine. You, what number are you of, of editors? It's a little bit hard to count, actually, because there were some editorial collectives in the early days. But uh, Sounds officially, very, very libertarian. Very libertarian. Officially, I am the ninth editor of Reason and the uh, the third female editor. Yeah, and perhaps the first editor with purplish hair. The last editor of Reason. Yeah. Because after that, it's all just going to be done by robots. Uh, Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I I think this is a pretty perfect time or maybe a depressing time to have you on because (laughs) because I'm obsessed with uh, free speech and and Mark Zuckerberg's recent op ed in the the Washington Post. Uh, He's been banging this drum for please, government, help me regulate speech online. And I feel like the conversation we're going to have today is is free speech dead is it done is it over and and reason magazine from day one we're talking about lanny friedlander your founder it it was um and maybe people in the comments can correct me but i feel like if i was to point to one journalistic endeavor one magazine that was consistently free speech over all 50 years there's been no waffling there's been no well but maybe this time we need to censor speech but even the ACLU is in the tank. And what the hell's going on? I don't know. I mean, I do think the that question, the question of, you know, is free speech in trouble? Are we at the end of free speech? Is related now so tightly to the question of, are we also at the end of the era of the free internet? Because I think uh, for a long time, um, the sort of unregulated space of the internet, the sort of wild wild west uh, ethos that um that pervaded particularly early online communities it, it gave an extra lease on life to free speech i think free speech would have been long since over if it weren't for this extra frontier and so you know part of my kind of natural futurist tendency is to say well the next internet will save us like yeah. whatever it is and yeah. i'm i am not a technologist i am not an entrepreneur so i actually don't know what that is and i don't know when it's coming but um, certainly our politics aren't going to save us. So right, right. we have to we have to hope for that. I, I've, I've tended to be a romantic as well. And, and, and um, Nick Gillespie just published a piece where he quotes John Perry Barlow. And I, I'm part of that, that vision that, that the internet was going to uh, create the right to know and, and equalize things across all uh, classes and cultures and, and government attempts at censorship. Um, and we just had we just had Patrick Byrne on, and he is working on uh, something that he calls a tech stack for civilization. Okay. And, and so he's got like blockchain solutions to everything. Ironically, we didn't talk about a blockchain solution to Facebook, and I I know there's projects out there that are doing that, but he's he's doing um, voting that can't be corrupted. He's doing a stock market that can't be gamed. He's doing um, enforceable property rights. In, in places like Africa where you getting the title to your home has been impossible. Um, so I happen, I, I, I believe, and it's, it's, it's more a, 
a faith-based thing than a tech-based thing. Right, which is unsatisfying to yeah. rationalists, right? And it's it, right. and I, you know, I think this also gets us into the problem of um, people on the right and people on the left each have a solution to the problem of speech or the problems that that free speech represents, right? And so, um, on the left, we now have this extensive, sort of recursive self-consuming conversation about hate speech and intersectionality and what's permissible to say and what's not permissible to say. Um, And that conversation has left the idea of free speech fundamentalism so far behind, right? There's there's now uh, just a totally different framework on the left for um, how would we even think about what people are allowed to say? Yeah. And the idea maybe people should be allowed to say whatever they want is is gone from that conversation and of course on the right people have always wanted to protect the children from the adult content or to um, minimize the realm for violent or sexual speech Um, i mean i'm sure you know you and i are old enough to remember the v chip and other associated which were actually bipartisan but um but uh you know i think that conversation on the left and the right has now moved into this space. And, and of course, also on the right now, uh, what should we do about the fact that those lefties in Silicon Valley won't let us say whatever we want on their platforms, which is, you know, to my mind, totally antithetical to the true principles of free speech. Yeah. Um, the ACLU has moved much more in the lefty direction. And I think that leaves a certain type of civil libertarian quite lonely in the middle saying speeches and violence People who own platforms get to say get to decide what appears on their platforms. Anyone can say anything they want in the public space. Yeah, the end. It does. It does feel kind of lonely, and I'm old enough to remember when conservatives would rally against the fairness doctrine because right. it, it was letting the FCC decide whose voice got heard, which and now seemed we have, like a bad idea. And now we have the president, right. you know, tweeting and saying. Um, well, tweeting some quite extreme rhetoric, although I think as is the pattern with Donald Trump, what he says he might do or what he asserts he is allowed to do is quite different than what he actually does. And in the current issue of Reason, we actually have a really interesting piece, I think, by Gene Healy, who is, you know, the foremost theory of uh, the ever theorist of the ever expansive executive. He's, you know, he's written a huge amount about how recent presidents have... Cato Scholar. Cato Scholar Gene Healy. And uh, he says, actually, a couple years in here, even though Trump's rhetoric is quite extreme, he will probably leave the presidency diminished in power. He will probably actually wind up not pushing the envelope in the way that Obama did or even that Bush did. Um, He is all talk, no action, essentially. And that while he is using powers that executives before him usurped he is not he has not so far actually expanded the scope of those powers all that is by way of saying he says i'm going to take away your citizenship if you burn a flag what he might actually do is follow in the footsteps of some of his early 20th century predecessors and use things like broadcast licensing or um, other kind of regulatory measures to restrict speech he's he's said quite clearly you know maybe the fairness doctrine is a good idea Maybe we should expand the scope of libel law. Stuff like that, I think, is where the actual legal frontier exists on the right. Yeah. And and the other day he suggested that we needed a government alternative to CNN globally. <laughs> and I, I, I wonder if he's like trolling me every time he says this, because I agree with you. Like the, the things he says are sort of fundamentally antithetical to uh, limiting executive power and keeping the government out of questions like speech and everything else. But... But he, it, it, it's like a, it's like a negotiating ploy. He's, he's, he's either virtue signaling to his base, or he's trying to bring um, corporations to the table so that he can get them to comply in some, you know, quote unquote, voluntary way. Right. Which brings us to our now kind of monthly routine where Congress brings in some head of a large corporation and you know, wags their fingers and says, hey, you guys got to do better. Right. Uh, And usually there's also a part in the middle there where they hold up their phones and like demand tech support, which is my favorite part, you know, where it's like my inner tubes don't have the right Googles on them. And you're like, oh, thank God, please stop. (laughs) Um, 
But we should name names, by the way. That was uh, who was that? Well, the the series of tubes comment is now like a real classic. I think that was Ted Stevens, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was the although first. It's, it's now so long ago. Even you know, it's it's just become like a cultural meme. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, this it happens every time, right? Like it's there. There is an infinite supply of crotchety old grandpas whose phones don't work. Who the want average to age regulate. of a U.S. senator actually precedes the car, let alone yeah, the internet. Exactly. Um, to me, though, the alarming development isn't the desire by a bunch of crotchety old grandpas to tell people what to do. It's Mark Zuckerberg showing up and saying, yes, let's do it. I yeah. would love to work with you. And this is, of course, the classic Baptists and bootleggers uh, on the Reason podcast on Monday. I sort of misspoke and, was, and said Baptists and bootlickers, which is... Also Seems more on true, point, yeah. frankly, like, you know, the idea like, you know, senator, congressman, I would love to work with this august body who surely has the best interests of the American people yeah. in mind to regulate my competitors out of existence is essentially what um, where Zuckerberg is now. And as a defensive posture, I understand it. Right. If he's looking out for what is it, what are his Q1 reports going to look like what are you know what what's what's going to happen to a stock price i get it why he is why he's wound up where he has but you know i w- i wish there was an alternate history where as an act of principle they said you know what this is not the business we're in see i'm i'm more cynical i and and i don't want to go all conspiracy theorist on oh, do on it. my dear audience yes you but do you, you really you want watch to watch the original mark zuckerberg testimony and I'm fairly convinced that he's a lizard alien wearing a uh, human okay. human face. We're going actual because yeah. no, I I have long I I've put down this marker. I will say it again: when the lizard alien faces come off, Shep Smith is clearly yeah. their leader. Yeah, like there's just something about his eyes. That are but but they've apart. they've they've clearly taken over the tech industry right. and and, sure. and they're handing over the, the <laughs> mechanisms of our ultimate demise. And we all know where this ends up at the Matrix. This is what's going to happen. Wow, this is good. This was some quality. I I thought you were going to go uh, legit conspiracy, but you went you went lizard people. So yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, no, I think. I mean, I do think this idea though, like, there's a reason that conspiracy theories are of interest again, right? right. There's a reason that there's been kind of an uptick in, in particular, this this um, sort of subgenre. Uh, of mainstream outlets covering the ways in which conspiracy theories interact with mainstream politics of typically yeah. of conservatives, right? And and yeah, you know, there's a lot there right now. But it's I get it that it's hard not to be a conspiracy theorist when the part that's happening in front of the cameras right. is big government and big business agreeing to work together to restrict your speech, yeah. right? Like that's the part they're saying while people are watching. So I. I, I I am not myself a conspiracist. I always, always think you should assume incompetence over conspiracy. You know, that is a hard and fast rule of human interactions. But um, but in this case, it is clear that the situation that is optimal for the most powerful people is one in which yeah. big tech and big government collaborate. I may have um, stolen this from Alex Jones. I don't know. Maybe he, I don't know who no. originated the lizard people thing, but uh, there were some great memes on on social media about that, but but let's let's distinguish between Big C Alex Jones whack job conspiracy theorists versus Small C conspiracy theorists going all the way back to Adam Smith, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna steal your phrase Baptists and, and bootlickers. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was Bruce Yandel, and I think there's an old Reason interview with Nick with Bruce Yandel who came yeah. up with this uh, the phrase Baptists and and I'm going to say now you can't say I can't it. even so you say it the right your way bootleggers bootleggers which was the unholy collusion between um, uh, teetotalers who didn't want anybody to drink and bootleggers who didn't want a legal market that would undercut their price position and that's a fairly standard practice in Washington DC and and Adam Smith talked about it in the wealth of nations, that the natural pl- proclivity of businesses to to conspire against the public, I I don't think libertarians emphasize that enough. Like we're we're so busy defending capitalism that we sort of ignore the fact that um, capitalism in the modern context really is more about cronyism than than free markets. I mean, I actually I would I would push back a little bit on that and say I don't think it's more about cronyism than the free market. I still think that the the 
sort of increase in trade and commerce globally over the last couple of decades, which, you know, as you and I have discussed many times, is, you know, the most powerful force for good yeah. uh, in recent memory. Uh, you know, that those are still fundamentally expanding markets that dramatically increase pe pe people's choices. But I, I, it is important to say that um, there's a huge distinction between uh, sort of totally voluntary mutual gains from trade and that thing that we saw in the Zuckerberg op-ed, the thing that we're seeing on the Hill where it's powerful people conspiring to limit the rights and choices of ordinary people. And that I, I totally agree with you that there is no reason for libertarians to reflexively defend anybody that's making a profit. Right. Ha making a profit is not a sign of virtue. And this, of course, goes all the way back to, uh, you know, our dear sainted Ayn Rand, who the Fountainhead is a book about a genius who doesn't thrive a, a in the market. A moment of reflection about, about Ayn Rand. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there is, there is no reason to think that the paycheck equals providing a good or service that people genuinely want in every case. On the other hand, I still do think capitalism as a system is basically functioning and functioning well. Um, the thing that makes me nervous in the interaction right now between big tech and big government is, is it's almost like, you know, there's, <laughs> there's Baptists and bootleggers, but then there's also Catholics. Like there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different, reasons to restrict speech and a couple of choke points where it's easy to do so. Yeah. And I think that, you know, this is a place where, again, to be clear, if what Facebook wants to do, if Mark Zuckerberg wakes up in the morning and says, no one can use the letter E on my platform. Feel free, buddy. Like you right. do you. Right. That, like it, this is something that I do think conservatives who have gotten banned or shadow banned or, you know, Zeppelin band like I feel like there's all these like different things again sort of different levels of conspiracy there about how true those things are um but conservatives who have been pushed off a platform for outre speech suddenly tend to have caveats and they shouldn't it's 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 up to Jack right. at Jack at Twitter if he wants to let uh, you know, Gavin McGinnis or Alex Jones or anybody speak. Uh, I prefer a curated speech environment for the most part, right? Like I don't just go out in the street and talk to people because I don't like people. I don't like talking to human beings as a general matter. It's a very libertarian approach. I yes. just want to talk to the people I want to talk to. Right. And, you know, the fact is that um, Twitter and Facebook and other platforms have enabled me to make my own choices about who I see speaking and who I speak to. Uh, it doesn't need to be done at a higher level. It can be done at the individual consumer level. And the tendency to wave that away is so intense on both sides. And I don't quite get it. Yeah. Right? Like both the left and the right say, oh, sure, you think you can curate your own feed, but that's not the point. And it's like, no, that's 100% the point. That's the whole point is you can curate your own feed and you can leave the platform entirely. Yeah. That, that and I, I tend to pick on on conservatives more. We had Robbie Suave on, and we spent a good hour picking on the the woke intersectionality of of speech limits from the left. But but you see guys like like Ted Cruz and and famously Tucker Carlson calling uh, essentially calling Facebook and uh, Facebook in particular a public utility, and it right. needed need to be treated like that. I'm because like, our public utilities work great and yeah. everything is awesome there. So we should definitely put more stuff in that category. And I and I, I'm mystified by both sides because the uh, you know today that the left, if you, if you want to regulate speech, you take you take Mark Zuckerberg at face value. And, and I want to get into that article because it's it's ominous on on many levels. But he's basically saying that the people in charge, who happens to be Donald Trump right now, mm -hmm. they should decide what appropriate speeches. Donald Trump, who is literally a fascist to the woke left, and they want to hand over the internet to these guys. And of course, the uh, the same thing I would say to the right. Um, AOC, Elizabeth Warren, fill in the blank. Who is your worst nightmare as the future president of the United States? Right. You're going to give her the power 
to decide whether or not you get to speak. And and these arguments seem to fall on deaf ears now. Like no one gets it. Like, oh my God, this, this government power thing, it might be dangerous. It could flip sides. Yeah. Well, in the other place I think that you see actually a very, very similar coalition is in the restriction of um, uh, sex work and, and commerce around sex on the internet, right? We had the, the passage of FOSTA-SESTA, which um, is a, a law that takes a pretty big bite out of um, Section 230, which is the the part of the legal code that allows, uh, that protects people who operate platforms from liability for posting on their platforms, right? So the idea that when you're Facebook and someone posts a comment on Facebook, you are not liable for whether that comment is accurate or fair or, you know, falls into any other legal category. Uh, and they basically took a big bite out of that and said, if you are facilitating commerce and sex, you are liable. And that immediately caused a shutdown of most of the internet spaces, the sort of semi-public or public internet spaces where people were buying and selling sex. And that is an absolutely classic Baptist and bootleggers coalition. It was it was feminists and uh, social conservatives, both of whom think sex work is bad. And uh, almost as bad as each other. Right. Yeah. Almost. Um, and this is, you know, this is again, you know, in this case, at least they agree on the outcome, which is like they don't want people to buy and sell sex on the Internet. Of course, people will still buy and sell sex. They just do it in the street now, which is no, not no, we're, we're this close to getting rid of a 2000 year tradition. Sure. I, I think 2000 is conservative there. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I think that's, you know, that's another example of. Um, there can be kind of a weird bipartisan push to restrict certain types of speech. And, you know, this is something that Elizabeth Nolan Brown at Reason has been arguing for years, which is once you enable this pathway, it's not just going to be used for sex work. Once you enable a pathway that basically says we are just making a utilitarian calculus about where we can restrict speech to eliminate the bad thing, uh, whatever it is, that we will start using that pathway for other restrictions, whether it's, um, and in fact, we're already there in some cases on national security, right? Like there are, there are um, much less publicized restrictions on speech. Um, you know, I think we all remember the, the big debate over the deplatforming of the YouTube video that may or may not have caused um, riots at an embassy on uh, September 11th anniversary. Um, also, of course, the war on drugs. There's, you know, any any law that is passed that uh, is meant to protect national security will inevitably be used to go after some kind of low-level drug dealer. And it, um, and it already is. And already, already is, is in so many ways. And so I think, you know, speech about anything that some people don't like is endangered by the existence of this fast assessed pathway and by the existence of this collaboration between big tech and big government. I think you might have said this on your podcast, but but the idea of, of of creating a regulatory framework to control Facebook is essentially a merger of one of the largest, most powerful corporations in the world with the largest, most powerful entity in the world, which is the federal government. Yeah. And, and of course, Mark goes a little bit further because he wants a global solution. Sure. Who doesn't want a global solution? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So I think, I mean, you know, this is something that we talk about at Reason a lot, that government doesn't like competitors. Government doesn't like a large, powerful thing that meets people's needs, that rises up alongside it. Um, this is, this is, you can see this in lots of areas, but, um, but I think you could, you can argue. I don't know that I would go all in on arguing, but I don't think it's a crazy thing to say that, um, the combined power of social media is probably the biggest threat to the state. And we see, we've seen this, you know, right. the Arab Spring is about this. And, you know, uh, periodic uh, platform shutdowns in Iran is about this. And China's super aggressive Internet censorship is about this. It is about the fact that the most powerful entities in the world recognize that this is the threat to their power. And that's why it's so troubling to see Zuckerberg saying like, yes, co-opt me, bring yeah. me into the fold. I want to be part of your thing. I will not stand in opposition to it. It is, um, it is a combination of creepy and maybe robot is, is a better analogy than, than, than lizard king, but whatever it is. Don't malign robots yeah, like that. Yeah. I know you're pro robot. I'm pro robot. I'm objectively pro robot. Um, the, you know, his arguments are, 
equally self-serving and sort of uh, pre-crime 1984 creepy at the same time because he's he's like you know when it comes to language that'll keep us safe and and he just he just wants to keep us safe and I whenever someone says that I, I run in the opposite direction um, but it's so self-serving like if 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 I'm going to get blamed as a, as a head of Facebook for for hate speech, why doesn't someone else figure out what that is for me? So I can always point the figure at some some government agency or some right. quasi government agency. And again, as a libertarian, I often will say, listen, I would rather there be no regulation and no law about most things. But if there is going to be regulation, if there are going to be laws, they should be clear. We should have rule of law. Right. And so I am sympathetic from that perspective to People who are saying, don't surround me with a dark cloud of legal threats that are vague and undefined. Like, tell me. Tell me what's illegal. I won't publish stuff that's illegal, but you got to tell me. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is something that's interesting. You know, not that the press has always totally honored its own mission statement about this, but in general, particularly deep-pocketed, um, large mainstream publications, they've drunk their own Kool-Aid about their role in society, right? I mean, this, you know, the New York Times uh, will fight for maximum leeway on its own speech rights because they believe it's morally good and also because it's good for their business model. And I think what we're seeing with social media is there's a divergence there, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't, you know, it may or may not be that what's good for society is good for their business model. And, you know, this is not to say the answer, which many people on the left and many people on the right would say, which is like, then abolish that business, like then perish. You know, right. that's not that's not the right answer. But um, I think we are used to the defenders of speech and the purveyors of speech being the press who the incentives are better aligned. Of course, um, there is sort of that elitist uh, pretense amongst uh, old paper media. Right. Well, that's why I say drunk their own Kool-Aid, right? Because yeah. it is... It we're, is... we're actually smart enough to be arbiters of what is appropriate right. speech. We, and... we can be trusted, but this internet thing? Yeah. Who knows no. what the kids like, on anybody the internet say are anything. saying. Um, and this is, you know, this is the space where magazines like Reason exist, like this right. place in between um, just any rando posting anything they want, which is a fully protected speech, right? And any rando should be able to post anything they want anywhere, provided that they are you know, within the terms of service and paying for it. At the same time, you know, there is a space somewhere south of all the news that's fit to print. Right. That's the way it is. Right. You know, three broadcast networks and an evening paper um, where I think magazines of opinion and, you know, startup publications and pamphleteers back in the day and, you know, whatever else, you know, use net boards. There's lots of, there's lots of in-between space where, um, moderated, edited content um, can provide alternate views. And, you know, again, I think it's weird when we have the president of the United States saying we need an alternative to CNN that's state sponsored. We have infinity alternatives to CNN. Yeah, I can't this count. This is an alternative to right. CNN. Yeah. It's, it's done. That niche is filled a thousand times over. It is a glorious fractal ecosystem of alternatives to CNN. Like, yeah. this is not a this is not an empty space. You know, fake fake news is kind of a version of fake news because you what everything you just described is exactly how a market would work through the process of vetting whether or not information is credible. And you as the the editor in chief in a magazine, you have a very strong incentive not to publish garbage because at if you develop a reputation as as publishing fake news or garbage, um, people that are looking for real news are going to go somewhere else. Sure. And there are also people who publish garbage and people consume garbage, right? Like people are trash. It's fine. But um, but there are, you know, if you've staked yourself out as a purveyor of truth, then, yeah, you have lots of incentives to attempt to, to get the story right. Um, you know, one thing I do think is interesting to bring us back to the Facebook question, though, is, um, you know, there's been a lot of pivoting to video in this world um, in no small part because Facebook fed false information to a lot of publications about the demand for video. Right. So there is, I think, there is always an interesting byplay between um, prices as information, which happens in many to most markets, but then there's also, there are also often 
layers of third parties. I mean, this is, you know, the ratings agencies in in uh, in the stock market is one reason that the housing crisis happened, right? Rating, rating agencies failed because their incentives got screwed up. Right. And I think we're seeing that with these social media platforms. I mean, Reason struggles every day to figure out how do we honor our mission, which is, you know, we're a nonprofit and our mission is just to get stuff out there. We want people to see what we have to say. And the place that we do that, one of the places we do that is Facebook, Twitter. You know, we do it on these platforms. And every day we're trying to figure out how do we get it out there, but also how do we not get ourselves in a position of dependence on yeah. if Mark Zuckerberg wakes up and says nobody can publish the letter E on this platform, we still need to be able to exist. Yeah, I mean, Free the People started very much as a Facebook-centric um, organization um, back when there seemed to be a lot less restrictions on on content, and it's it you know it could be censorship. I mean, they definitely put uh, red flags over our videos about socialism, for instance, mm -hmm. um, which absolutely suppresses the number of people that will see that. But it's it, it it's probably more about just monetization. Like they they view me as a piggy bank, and every time that I want to um, publish something on any of our Facebook properties, they're, they're like that's money for us. So, and I get that. I mean, I, I could live with that, but, but I think, I think what we're thinking about is, is broad diversity, diversification in our distribution model. And it, it can't just be social media. We gotta, we gotta look at other types of platforms. I have and, an idea. You should print what you do on paper and mail it to people every month. Yeah. It's a wild new business model, but I think it's going to work. Everything comes full circle yeah. and, and we're going to be killing a lot of trees and <laughs> and publishing uh, secret Tom Paine style um, rants. And, I'm ready. And handing I'm, I'm going to I'm going to oil up the mimeograph machine. And we'll be ready to go. But let, let's go back tonight. I, I want to just wail on Mark Zuckerberg just a little bit more because this this article that showed up in the Washington Post a couple days ago um, happened um, about the same time that the New Zealand mosque murders happened. And, and a third headline um, showed up in the New York Times, I think yesterday, um, talking about uh, the Singapore government wanting to um, censor speech to protect people. Mm -hmm. And the reaction is, no, 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 that's an authoritarian government that is, is trying to squash dissent. And I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what the difference is. Like, how do, you, how do you keep people safe and not lose control of this process where, where some future authoritarian is going to use it to, to squash dissent? I, yeah, I don't I mean, know how they square that circle. I mean, I think, you know, in New Zealand, right, they... they banned the reproduction of the shooter's manifesto, right? Yeah. So you can't um, share the video, you can't even read the manifesto and right. God forbid you share. Like the, the 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 penalty for that is jail time. Like right. real jail time. And I, I do think that's the kind of thing that, you know, people say like, well that's just a common sense reform. And then the next thing you know, uh you know, you're you're down a very dark path. And so I think that's, you know, that is absolutely the place to be vigilant that is the place where the danger lies is in the moment of crisis when it feels like well what possible benefit could there be from letting people share this nonsensical hate-filled document which has demonst which is demonstrably directly connected to a horrific act of violence right it seems like well what's the harm in in just restricting that i mean we're not right, we're not right. saying you can't have your podcast you know you have yeah. the americans and i think i think that's the that's really the place where you need to throw up a barrier and you know to me it's always you know it's just the distinction between public and private and i know that it's a broken record thing to say and that it also isn't satisfying because it isn't a macro solution it isn't a single sweeping solution it isn't you cannot read or publish this thing anywhere in the country Right, which is the kind of thing that people want to hear. And instead to say, listen, it's up to the owners of every website, of every physical private space, of every institution to decide whether that thing can be consumed or reproduced inside their institution. And it's it's not... Um, you know, it doesn't have the sense of finality, but there will always be people like Reason who will say, 
or you know there will always be people like the the danish paper that reproduced the muhammad cartoons like there will always be someone who will say to suppress this completely is to make it more dangerous you know there's to to make it forbidden is to make it more powerful yeah you know sunlight is a disinfectant like there will always be charlie abdos um and so that's enough that's enough to me is as long as you can leave those safety valves in place but when singapore or new zealand shutter you know shuts those down right. i think i think you set up a very dangerous situation yeah so you you mentioned charlie hebdo and and i have to say that that reason absolutely was the best in terms of of covering um, that disaster and matt welsh's piece on that was yeah, matt, was very very good it was it was definitive and and I, I thought of, I went back and read some of that this morning because after I read the Zuckerberg piece, he when he talks about a global standard, he specifically cites the work that they're doing with France mm-hmm. to help determine what is what is appropriate speech, what is safe speech, and and you go back to some of the stuff that Matt's written is it it the 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 number one enemy to, of Charlie Hebdo was the French government, and they they were targeting. Uh, Charlie Hebdo in court for for going after the government for for going after various religions. It wasn't um, by they were an equal opportunity offender of yeah. of all sacred cows, which which I think is I think what free speech is about. Um, but the the French government has been horrible in in targeting free speech, and now Mark Zuckerberg says this is our model. Right. Let's let's defer to the French. That's Who right. defers to the French about almost anything except for like cheese and wine and. I don't know. There's yeah. some cool stuff there. There's some cool stuff there. I mean, I think that, yeah, this is, you know, the consequences of looking for a global solution will be that we follow the European model. And the European model is deeply flawed. The European model was conceived in an environment where protections for speech were never as robust as they are here. I mean, this is this is something that I think Americans can underestimate or take for granted that we genuinely have in our founding documents protections that are almost unmatched in the rest of the world. And so to say the European model is working, let's bring it over, is to say, let's disregard the things that make America unique. Let's disregard the things or minimize the things that made it possible for these platforms to be born here in the first place. And, you know, I think you can even see stuff like um, the GDPR rules, right? This sort of European privacy rules, which have caused every stupid website that you go to to now have this extra pop up that says, "Hey, do you?" Oh, it's so helpful, right? Yeah. Um, but actually, embedded in those are are a bunch of other sort of secondary restrictions that don't that don't make much of a difference to most commercial sites in the United States, but. Um, there are some age restrictions on certain types of content that you're agreeing to. There's, uh, you know, um, information retention rules that you're agreeing to. And there's, I think it's easy for there to be restrictions that sneak in under cover of stuff like that. Um, and this is a complaint against Facebook. They say like, well, those terms of service were so extensive. Who even knows what they agreed to? But if that's your complaint about Facebook's terms of service, you know, how can you possibly how can you possibly suggest that people consent to their laws, right? Like no one can, like if the terms of service of citizenship are the entire U S code and all of the state codes and all of the local codes, you know, don't come to me and complain about Facebook's 10 page thing. People don't know the rules that bind them and it's okay. Like there, we actually have a whole bunch of great workarounds to help people understand how to stay inside the bounds of legal or contractual behavior that don't require everyone to be a lawyer but it's i think it's a false argument to say you can't expect people to understand facebook terms of service when we're asking people to understand incredibly complex legal systems every single day and suffer not just the consequence of being banned or booted but the consequence of right. being jailed so that the eu regulations have have created what looks to be like a, a four-page disclaimer where you're you're signing away. I don't know what you're signing away, but every time you go on a website, you have to click, yep. yes, I understand the rules. So of course, Mark Zuckerberg's solution to this is to work in concert with our government to protect our privacy. So because the perhaps the one institution that is, is more systematically violating right. our privacy. Well, and, you know, the, the other place that I worry about a lot because because of 
I think our failure as libertarians and as Americans to throw up a real barrier is, you know, I think, for instance, that there's incredible social gains still to be had from at home genetic testing, just to take an example, mm -hmm. right? Like 23andMe, that kind of thing. Um, but there will be incredible incursions on privacy and an incredible loss of personal autonomy and separation from the from the criminal justice system unless there is some way for those companies to refuse to hand over data and mass. And right now, you're increasingly seeing stories about it's not just a warrant for a very specific piece of information vetted by a judge, which already that is a flawed system since judges tend to rubber stamp these sorts of things. But we're already moving beyond that and just, you know, dumping databases into government databases, which are poorly maintained, which aren't purged on an appropriate schedule, which are used for reasons other than those for which they are initially handed over. Um, it not only makes people less free and puts the state more in their lives, but it also disincentivizes people who are going to be the next 23 and me. I don't want to be a stooge for the state. I don't want to be, I don't want to wind up entangled in the criminal justice system just because I want people to be able to, I don't know, see whether they metabolize caffeine quickly. Yeah. Which I totally do. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's two solutions here. I would just, we, we could get all depressed about, about, no, about the cheerful. death of, of free speech. One of those solutions is the reason you guys exist, which is, is, is sort of, convincing people, um, talking to people who might be skeptical about the libertarian case for free speech. Um, what is, um, I'm on an elevator, you've never met me, which which is, first of all, your your worst nightmare that I'm yeah, talking no, to someone you I don't am, know. I already like, but yeah, I'm like, I, I saw you, you're getting twitchy. I saw you, you're one of those libertarians and you believe in free speech. That's ridiculous. What? Give, give your elevator pitch why free mm. speech matters. I think I'm just going to give you back what you said earlier in this conversation, which is, uh, you know, you might think that there are ways to put reasonable restrictions on free speech that will ultimately prevent harm. But I'd like you to think about the fact that imagine whatever politician you hate the most, that guy is now in charge of what you get to say. That doesn't seem like a country I would want to live in. It doesn't seem like a place I would want to be. And that is where we're headed, where somebody else gets to decide what's hateful, what's dangerous, what's bad for society, what's bad for you. And I think you're better at deciding all those things. The the other solution, that's, that's pretty good, but maybe I just think that because you quoted me back. Yeah. 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 You think you think my argument, which I stole from you, is a good argument. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm totally persuaded. Let's say, give me another one. But the, but the other um, and and of course this is what you guys do every day. You're you're trying to reach beyond the um, uh, the the libertarian bubble, as small as it is. There's very few of us who are sort of self-aware libertarians, despite our best aspirations. Um, um, but there's all there's there's a whole generation that that you guys and and I have extensively argued that there's this liber liberty curious generation out there, young people sort of swim in in a world of of choice and and liberty and and self-determination that that is very different than how i grew up um, and i'm optimistic about that but um your your job is to talk to that audience but i'm i'm sort of hoping for a technological fix here because the this for the same reason you, you started this conversation by saying that that facebook Without Facebook, the cause of free speech would, would be far worse than it is today um, because of attempts to restrict old media and, and the, the natural convergence of, of government and, and corporate players. So we're going to need another hack of the system. We're going we're gonna to need like a, a blockchain solution here. Yeah, and I do, I do actually think there is something to the war of all against all in this, right? Like the idea that wherever there is censorship, there will be a, a schism. There will be another platform. There will be a new, more encrypted or based on a different technology alternative um, because history has borne that out. I mean, I, I think ultimately... Every conversation is also like this is also a conversation about prohibition and prohibitions don't work. Yeah. So if you want to prohibit certain types of speech, it's not like that speech goes away. That's not what happens under prohibition. What happens is you create a black market in that speech. You create underground venues for that speech. And eventually someone figures out how to 
bring it back up into the light. And I think the, you know, the story of the criminalization of marijuana and then the subsequent legalization of it is absolutely the template for hope on all of these things. Like the idea that something could be vilified at the highest levels of government for decades and that people would look at their own experience and say, the story that government is telling me in collaboration with the media, by the way, like yeah. let's remember, you know, all of our, this is your brain on drugs ads. Um, it's not a true story. It's not a story that reflects my experience. And, um, you know, I think the success of legalization of marijuana is due in no small part to the fact that people were able to talk to each other online and in different modes than in their dare class in school right i mean there were other ways to talk about this in a systematic way and so i guess i think there is there is hope in the question of you know it's probably not gab which i don't know does that still exist even but like it's something there will be something that will emerge um you know, the kids these days apparently chat in Google Docs. I learned that from a uh, Taylor Lorenz article in The Atlantic recently because it looks like they're doing homework. Yeah. So they just chat. They put a bunch of people in a Google Doc. Like that kind of workaround, people are great at that sort of thing. And we're going to figure out another workaround if Zuckerberg becomes the senator from Facebook. You know, the the uh, you, you talked about sex work and the war on drugs. Um, there's 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 an upside and a workaround and a positive story about that stuff but there's also the unintended consequences of 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 prohibition um with with sex work it becomes dangerous yep and with drugs it creates drug gangs that become very dangerous i think i feel like the same thing is is true on free speech if there are white supremacists out there if there are people spewing hate and threatening to to kill people based on their religious beliefs um, I'd rather it be out in the open. I'd rather civil society had a, a way to sort of like uh, shame them into uh, oblivion as opposed to keeping it in the shadows where it, it can fester. And, and you know, frankly, if it's forbidden, I wonder about for, forbidding the manifesto, is there some confused kid somewhere that is thinking, well, the government doesn't want me to read that. So maybe it must it's be so true. powerful. Yeah. It must be so true. Sure. Of course there is. Absolutely. Of course there is. And I think this is, you know, this isn't down entirely to restriction or openness of speech. You know, I think you could say in the case of um, extremist Islamic terror, we have free religious speech in this country. No one is restricting the speech of of people who um, who hold those who hold those religious beliefs or even the speech of people who hold attendant extreme political beliefs, um, the thing that they're using private modes of communication for is to coordinate acts of violence. And so I think, you know, there's also a danger of when you open up, um, when you create the incentive to build very, very private secretive channels, people will start to do things in those channels. I mean, this is, you know, when you when you dig a tunnel under the border to bring weed over, well, then you can start smuggling people over. You can do you know you can do whatever you want. I of course think both weed and people should be able to come across the border in the bright light of day. But um, but yeah, I think I think that's right. The that it should you when you say prohibitions don't work, you should always pair that with, and they impose a tremendous amount of harm and unintended consequences along the way. So if, if people want to get these refreshing alternative views, what is the best way? Give us give us a shameless plug. I for would a love to do that. They can go to reason.com where we uh, post all of our content for free every day. Uh, they could also subscribe to Reason Magazine and get our long form articles and investigative reporting before we give it away on the internets. Uh, I think our subscription price at this point is like Fifteen or twenty dollars an issue, or fifteen or twenty dollars a year. Uh, it's a pretty good bargain. Uh, they can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Reason TV, or they can subscribe to our podcast, which is called Imaginatively the Reason Podcast. Yeah, very creative, we super try. creative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube, click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.